I call this meeting the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for Mrs. Hummel spending her 29th birthday with us again today. Uh, can I get a motion for certification at closed session, please? Mr. Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discuss only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law and only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Zombie. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dowell. Is there any discussion? Ms. Aller? Ms. Owenby. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. That brings us to the public hearing on fiscal year 23 capital, capital improvement plan. I call the public hearing to order. Mr. Dowell. Do you have instructions? There are a few instructions. So those citizens desiring to speak have handed sub, uh, submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. The citizens are asked tonight engage in applauding, verbal outbursts of any other type demonstrations during the presentation. Personnel matters are not considered in public meetings. Therefore, the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments, your comments are heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated one minute and 30 seconds to make their presentation, and the board asks that you respect this time limitation. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Our first and only speaker is Mr. Jay Everson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jay Everson, 6923 Chantry Lane in Cornell Heritage. I have to admire your persistence of the central office and the school board because I see that the elementary school is back on the CIP after it was defeated last January by the, your funding partner at the county at 5-0 vote. I have provided you all with some information here about the capacity. This community decided a long time ago that 85% we would be discussing <coughs> new facilities. You will see that the average person, people in this room and people who are your neighbors, I think would all agree that elementary school is K through five. And even your future think and all your materials you put out on future think indicate K through five. However, to get to these big numbers or to require a elementary school, you have to redefine an elementary school to mean two year old in diapers to fifth, to fifth grade. We are currently, as of last year's numbers, at 82%, at 82 percent, 80, 80, take that back. Without the bright beginnings, we're at 82.5 percent. We shouldn't even be talking about this at this point in time. There are several options out there, and we brought this up, I brought this up before. <coughs> we can add on just a, a pod, just like we have at Laura Lane two places for about $9 million, $12 million. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everson. I appreciate that. Any other comments? Any other comments? No, sir. Okay, with that, I will close the, the public hearing on the capital improvement plan. Uh, Ms. Aller, can you take the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Mr. Dowell. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Ms. Owenby. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion for approval of the agenda? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Young. Any discussion? Ms. Aller? Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Owenby. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. 5.01 announcement superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My report this evening begins with a focus on schools and some of the examples of incredible teaching and learning that has taken place in classrooms across the school division. For example, Stonehouse kindergartners are learning about sorting items into different groups. At the same time, their peers in second grade are using their favorite books to learn sentence structure. At Tuano, a special education class is learning about how plants grow through their work in the school garden. Hornsby science classes have also been taking advantage of the warm weather to learn about osmosis through outdoor activities. 
Lastly, Lafayette history students are learning about engineering of world empires through activities that demonstrate how structures could stand for so long. Studying engineering is not the only big thing that happened at Lafayette this month. Elena Mincher, a, a Lafayette English teacher, won a free kitchen makeover from Prestige Cabinets, one of our WJCC school's community partners. The community was invited to nominate their favorite teacher for their dedication during the pandemic. The program, Cabinets for a Cause, received over 300 nominations, more than triple the number from the previous year. Ms. Mincher received 28 nominations from students, parents, and former students. She has promised to send us before and after photos once the kitchen remodel is complete. Also this month, WJCC schools were invited to display their artwork at the annual occasion for the Arts Festival. The youth art display was impre impressive this year, taking in 2,500 square foot tent on Prince George Street. And finally, a reminder that tomorrow is Unity Day, a division-wide event for Bullying, Bullying Prevention Month. I will ask you all to join me in wearing orange tomorrow to show our commitment to kindness, acceptance, and tolerance. Mr. Chair, that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Owenby? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wanted to give a brief update on the Special Education Advisory Committee, which met last Thursday. I was not able to attend, but uh, received an update from staff as well as a board member, a committee member. Um, they have identified their leadership for this year. They've struggled with quorum, and so that has not been voted in. Um, there was an uh, introduction from Mr. Um, Adam Brown, who is the new director of special education. So he introduced himself to SEAC committee members. There was a conversation about the role of SEAC and understanding that completely. Another conversation about um, the work that they've done for the last three years on inclusion and whether or not that information that they presented to our, our board last spring would migrate through policy committee. Uh, they will have a new member orientation. They're lining up speakers because they have several new new committee members, so lining up speakers who can, who can address um, special education issues, kind of look at policy. Um, they will identify year-long goals in November. They're going to review their bylaws in November and hope to have a quorum at their next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ombi. Any other comments, Dr. Yes. Beers? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Humble and I um, had a chance to tour James River Elementary School um, <laughs> under the guidance of Mrs. Uh, Washington, um, and um, everything seemed to be running very, very smoothly. Um, uh, the students were engaged. Um, it was, I know it's hard with the mask, but I could see in their eyes, there were smiles. And, um, and, and, and the other thing that uh, we talked briefly about um, is that um, James River is going to have a webinar on October the 27th at 6 p.m. and it's the Family Academy webinar and it, the focus will be on how social uh, and emotional learning can help your children. That's, that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Any other, Ms. Hummel? I'll just add on to that report. It was a great visit with Principal Washington. Uh, we also got to hear from the counselors uh, at the school and the school nurse. So we got to meet up with them and kind of get an update on everything with regard to the, their appreciation for the additional counselor at, at uh, James River. It's really been very helpful. It also was a joy to see their outdoor classroom and the coordination that they've had with the Rotary Club, which I thought was wonderful. They, um, you know, you can't have a whole lot of um, volunteers inside the building because of COVID, so they've decided to kind of work on the beaut a beautification project. So they've got a playground um, painting project going on, and then they've they've beautified the outside of the school with, you know, ball mums and uh, all the nice things that make it a really beautiful school uh, that makes the kids want to come there and get excited about coming there. And we also met uh, a, a long-term volunteer 
a, that's a math tutor there, which I think is, he does wonderful things for the students. So I just wanted to sh put a shout out to the volunteers that are helping out at um, James River. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Any others? That takes us to 6.01 public comment. Mr. Dell. Sir, I think I'll read these instructions again. Yeah. Would that be necessary? Okay. Um, Citizens desiring to speak have already submitted speaker cards. We have 17 speaker cards here to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called. We had a request that I read the names twice at the beginning and then uh, bef before they're called forward. We'll try that tonight and see if it's not too clunky. Um, it's the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Citizens are asked to not engage in applauding or any other type of demonstration during the presentations. <clears throat> Personal matters are not considered in public meetings. Therefore, the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments, your comments are heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated one minute and 30 seconds to make their presentation, and the board asks that you respect this time limitation, and no time may be yielded to any other speaker. Our first speaker is Ms. Amy Taylor, and then Ms. Ann Marie Smith. Hello, my name is Amy Taylor. I work for a child therapist. I'm retired, a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Virginia. And um, there's an old saying, if it's not broke, it doesn't need to be fixed. And I feel that way about CRT very much so. I had a random conversation with a, uh, a teacher that teaches in, the, in the, uh, this area of uh, English as a second language. And she told me that all of her kids are all different races and different cultures, and they all love each other, and they all get along. And she's very much against uh, CRT. So as I said, if it's not broke, it doesn't need to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ann Marie Smith, and then Mr. Carrie Taylor. Hi, good evening. Um, once again, I would ask the board to, um, the board or the superintendent to submit a written definition of CRT. Um, that could be read at the next board meeting and then posted permanently on our website. Um, Superintendent Heron had stated uh, several meetings ago that CRT is not taught in our schools, so this definition will be a means to hold that statement true so that we can keep it out. Um, and then secondly, I'd like to reiterate that we please consider eliminating the mask mandate for the school division, and when the time comes, leave COVID vaccination decisions to parents who know what's best for their children. So to clarify that, please do not implement COVID vaccine mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Carrie Taylor, and then Ms. Robin Pavlowski. Good evening, I'm Carrie Taylor, and I'm here to uh, talk about uh, uh, CRT, or as it's sometimes known, cultural competency training. Studies and statistics are frequently presented as evidence by researchers promoting these. but the, these are statistics and studies are only as good as the people and the data behind them. From courses on survey techniques, we know that asking the right questions, the wording of the questions, the right assumptions, collecting the right data, analyzing the data correctly are all crucial to a valid conclusion. All of these can be manipulated easily by researchers conducting a study. One well, of the best examples of this is when the cigarette companies used to advertise on the back of Parade magazine. These ads reported that medical firms show that cigarettes were not harmful to your health, and I don't think that anybody believes the accuracy of those today. I tend to trust studies also where the conclusion was not expected by the researchers. In one case over here, the Washington Post did a uh, study on race and age discrimination in hiring. They expected the 20% race discrimination, but surprisingly, they did not expect the 40% age discrimination. And so I would like to caution you to be quite skeptical of anyone who claims that their studies prove their point, for there may be just as many other studies that prove just the opposite. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Robin Pavlowski, and then Ms. Susan Friends. 
I'm Robin Pavlosky, and first of all, thank you for everything that you do. It's, I know it's difficult. I speak to you tonight as a mother of three children and a citizen of James City County. Month after month, parents, grandparents, and concerned citizens come to speak to you about their concerns. This is happening all over the country in many states. This is the first clue that something is wrong. We are not here to create issues, but to ask you to work with the people who have elected you or those who are, are appointed because you are the representatives of the most vulnerable population, our children. If this was about reading and writing, et cetera, I wouldn't be here. This is about the policies such as CRT and transgender and all these things that are dividing us as a, as in, our, in our state and in our country. This is, it's not what's happening here. We aren't cooperating together. Can we re be reasonable and settle this together? What if we became the school district with a board who included parent ideas and worked things out? We would be able to accomplish so much more. You're not the enemy and neither are we. There are many issues right now dividing us all and we can't deny this. This is wrong. Do the right thing and work with all of us. Our children are depending on us to be adults. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pavlovsky. Ms. Susan Franz and then Mr. Harry Williams. I'm Susan Franz. Um, I don't have any kids in school. I'm a taxpayer and I care about the children of James City County. Complicit. According to the Webster's Dictionary, this means helping to commit a crime or do wrong in some way. I suggest that based on this definition, the WJCC school board is complicit. You are complicit in enforcing mask mandates, supporting all gender bathrooms, carrying pornographic content in libraries, teaching critical race theory, and eventually requiring COVID injections for all students and staff. This is all wrong. You are complicit in supporting a new world order that the majority of parents and taxpayers do not support. Compliance is the way the Holocaust happened. Good people said nothing. However, we, the parents and taxpayers, will stand against your complicity in every peaceful and legal way possible. I want to think the best of you, that you are good people. Unfortunately, just as in the days of the Holocaust, I am concerned that you are good people who will do nothing. Your compliance will destroy not only the physical and mental health of the children, but America as well. Thank you. Mr. Harry Williams and then Ms. Toby Wiseman. Um, hello, my name is Harry Williams. I'm a sophomore at Lafayette High School and I'm here to discuss your transgender bathroom policy. On Friday, I was in the men's bathroom using the urinal when a female student came out of the stall. It made me extremely uncomfortable, so I told the principal what happened. He told me that maybe the person identified as another gender. I was shocked to learn this was allowed in our schools. These policies create an environment that is unsafe for students in this district. Predators can take advantage of this, as was done in Loudoun County. This concerns me less for myself, but more for my eight-year-old sister. The thought of her being forced to use the bathroom with a man makes me sick. Do you really want your male teachers using the bathroom with female students? They can claim they identify as female under this policy and be in the bathroom with female students or teachers. The majority of students should not be forced to be in an unsafe environment due to the needs of very few. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Toby Wiseman and then Mr. Todd Cox. Good evening, school board members and superintendent. Uh, first, I want to say how encouraging it was to hear your thoughtful deliberation regarding the policy changes after the proposed policy changes after the last board meeting. And so I hope that same sort of uh, level of discourse will be applied to other challenging issues that are raised. For me tonight, that is CRT. As a black woman, I am insulted that I should consider myself as oppressed. Have I experienced individualized racist encounters? Yes. Do I see systemically racist institutions around me? No. Namely, we've had a black president and we currently have a black female vice president. As a parent of biracial children, I am appalled that my children and others are exposed to a critical, divisive theory that is not fact and that was pushed to DOE by then 
at that time Governor McAuliffe in 2015. The level of cognitive dissonance and self-loathing in our children as a result is dangerous. There are children who are waking up hating their skin color because they are being told that they are an oppressor or oppressed. Will you affirmatively disavow and eliminate CRT from any further faculty training and teaching pedagogy? Will you prioritize actual education for our children so that they can compete for jobs that children in India and China are getting because they are actually being educated? The majority of people here would support your stand for ac academically competent education that recaptures lost time due to COVID rather than color and race-based CRT. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wiseman. Todd Cox and then Ms. Brenda Abbott. Good evening. My name is Todd Cox. I have two children here in James City County. One of them is, uh, actually I'm gonna start off and just say, I wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight, voicing their opinions, and us have the opportunity to be here to do this. Uh, it's not in every country that we're allowed to do this, it's a democratic republic, and we are fortunate to be able to do that. I encourage our decision making that happens here and amongst everybody uh, to, um, I want everybody to understand that this will forever be written in history. So our decisions today to keep the freedoms that we have to make all of these decisions needs to stay here. Once that's given up, we have no more freedoms to make decisions anymore. Um, my opinion on a couple things is based on a lot of research, too much that, uh, that it won't fit in 90 seconds. Um, but I do wanna say, uh, as far as CRT, I have a mixed race son and I have a full white son. That being said, how do I teach my kid that may or may not, because he has to face the public school system, identify me or his own brother as somebody that's being oppressive in society? We didn't do that and we don't wanna encourage that. Our differences are what makes our strength in this world. Uh, as far as the mandates, as the vaccines and the masking and everything, it's foolish. I think people need to do their own research, deep research, not follow propaganda, uh, and then come up with a decision that fits them best. But ultimately, our freedoms are what gives us the choice to do that. Once they're gone, we don't get them back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Ms. Brenda Abbott, and then Ms. Carolyn Petrina. Good evening, my name is Brenda Abbott. I wanna start by saying I believe that every single person on the board, every single person in the audience, and every single person holding a sign on the street share one to same desire, that every single student have access to academic instruction that will help them attain success in their adult life. I'm really heartened to hear that you actually took parental and public account for the policy at your last meeting. I'm really concerned that what I see happening around the country is a, a total disconnect between those on the board, those that, who are teaching, those who are elected officials, assigned officials, politicians running for office, and parents in the public. I feel a lot of this is because there is a total lack of understanding of what each side and each person involved believes and expects from the roles that they have. I, what I really believe is that it's imperative that every elected official assigned by an elected official and candidate running for office needs to be open and transparent about what the relationship and what the expectation of those in authority or elected in official positions and parents in public have. While I get that that's a very big thing to do, I'm asking people, all of you, to actually address this recent letter by the National School Board Association. I'm well aware of what the Virginia State Board Association responded, but I believe it's really important for us to understand exactly how you feel our role is and how we can work together as a team. We can't work together as a team unless we have a clear understanding of what those expectations Thank are. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Abbott. I appreciate it. Carolyn Petrina, and then Ms. Lewis Key. Good evening. I want to thank you for letting the parents and the community speak tonight. I think it's critical that we keep the lines of communication open between the school board members and parents. As a taxpayer, I think it's incredibly important. In the past, I've spoken about school uni uniforms, education excellence, not indoctrination, keeping CRT in any form out of our schools 
revising the mask policy to follow the science, but today I have two new issues to address the board with. Issue number one, are you aware that the VDH is asking for input to, um, from, from uh, Virginians to mandate uh, their opinion on mandating vaccines for all teachers and students for public and private school, no exceptions, not even religious exemptions, uh, except, uh, sorry, no, not even religious exemptions. Um, so I would like to know where you all stand on this. And I can tell you that as a teacher here in Virginia, if this mandate passes, I will no longer teach in Virginia. I will no, not at all have my student, my child, be a student in Virginia, in a, in a Virginia school. I think it's very bad policy. Issue number two, I think it's important to state the current transgender policy. I know it's a big concern for everybody here, and I think we all want the safety of our children in the schools. Thank so we need to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petrina. Ms. Lewis Key, and then Ms. Mary. Slokovich. Good evening. My name is Louise Key, and I am a parent of two elementary age children here in James City County. Last night, my six year old daughter told me that her teacher's mom died. My daughter thought that her and her classmates were the reason her teacher's mom died. She thought it was because of COVID and because she doesn't always have her mask up. The truth is, my daughter's teacher. My daughter's teacher's mom died because she was elderly and had some other illness. I share this tonight as, as an example of how consumed our children are with COVID. Please consider the emotional and psychological effects the ongoing mask mandate is having on our children. Fear of COVID is being thrown at them every single day and their beautiful smiling faces are being covered in masks. They are afraid they're being taught to fear, afraid to get close to others. This is not normal or healthy for their emotional and sorry, their emotional and social development. Thank you for allowing me to share this evening. I know I speak on behalf of many parents who just want their kids to go to school and not have to wear a mask. They have worn them long enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Key. <laughs> Mary Slokovich, and Mr. John Slokovich. After that. Good evening, my name is Mary Slokovitz, and that was very hard to follow, and I agree with everything she said. I have a one-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, and six-year-old, and this is my first son in school. He's in kindergarten. If I have to bring my other three in this school district, they'll be staying home as well. But today I wanted to ask why my six-year-old has to start school at 940 and get out of school at 410, even with the bus driver shortage, it would start at 9.30 and come out at 4, which means they don't get home and settled until 4.45. That's if you have the luxury of parent pickup. Bus kids get home at 5.30. Sports start at 5.30 and don't end until 6.37. And after dinner and baths, it's 8 o'clock, which gives us about five minutes a day with our son because I have to get three other kids dressed for school, sports, take care of my one-year-old while my husband is working. Will the times ever be earlier? Two elementary schools start at school start at 8:30. Will that swap next year for the two other ones that start at 9:30 so we could go earlier? We are fortunate enough to own our own business in town, but most people start jobs at 8:30 or 9 o'clock. 9:30 drop off and 4:10 pickup is way too late. They are too young to be getting out of school at 4 p.m. Please consider the effects this is having on a lot of families in town. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Slowskowitz. Mr. John Slokovich, and then Mr. Ty Lagerman. Here we are. Another month has passed, another 30 seconds off of our speech time. Uh, another month with no discernible progress being made on the issues that we're bringing at hand. And as far as I can tell, no one on this board has addressed any of the concerns, any of the major concerns that have been brought to light over the last four months. You attempt to push an agenda that very few educated people agree with. You speak about citizens of this community that you claim to represent with such disdain that it's appalling. You label parents as unruly agitators and now as domestic terrorists because they question unverified, unproven, and unconstitutional doctrine that you mandate. 
You treat this room and the people in it as though it is, your, is in your control. You allow applauding when it suits your agenda, but demonize it when it is in support of opposition. Unless you're going to allow every single person in here, not two minutes, not three minutes, not even four or five, but the amount of time that they see fit to make their statement or point, then applauding is the only way that we have of showing our support and the only way that we can be heard. For you to take that freedom of expression away is on par with what communist monarchs and Nazi dictators impose. Silencing the voice of the people is something this country has vehemently opposed since its inception, and I will be damned if I will allow it to happen on my watch. For thousands of years, leaders of all persuasions have demonized that which they don't understand, and you have done, you've become no different. You mock and ridicule us, those who stand up for our children and talk poorly about us in a manner that you think is behind our back. I'll give you a little bit of insight. When the public comment portion of this meeting is over, many of us will walk out and we will leave. We do this Thank in protest of this Thank ridiculous you, circus you run. Thank you, Mr. Slokovitz. Mr. Ty Lagerman and then Mr. That. Randy Mathis. <clears throat> My name is Ty Logman. I'd like to use this opportunity to revisit a proposal I've raised before to have us live stream and record our instructional classes. And it was at the time when I talked about it, because we have so many kids who are staying home because of COVID or other things, it's an opportunity for kids to go back and review content because learning with masks is a challenge. And what I think is even more appreciated now, given the NSBA, VSBA roles with, about parents, is it allows parents to be involved again in their kids' instruction. COVID has is, is pushed the, the parents out, but yet the number one determinant of a child's performance is going to be parental involvement. And if we provide parents the opportunity to see what's being taught, they can help with homework, and they can also rest assured that we are doing what we say that we intend to do, right? And so if there are issues about politicized content or behavior that you know, we would find objectionable, you have it right there to see. We talk about privacy in the classroom, but it's the same thing as a police officer wearing a body cam. We should be able to be willing to show what we're doing in the class. We should make it transparent to the parents and make it available for the student to go back to. So I'd like to revisit that and you know, maybe have some determination as we go into the budget cycle. Put the money there, let's allocate. We learn how to live stream our classes during COVID, Let's do it systemically, improve the process, and make our classrooms more reliable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lockman. Hey, Mathis, and then Ms. Laura Cottle. First topic, transgender. Uh, we're allowing a slim minority rule a, a vast majority. If there's one, in, one student in 300, that's a third of 1%. Let's keep the biological boys in the boys' room, biological girls in the girls' room. God made boys and girls differently. Yeah. It's not fair if the biological boys are on the girls' team and win. Why do you think they have separate boys and girls' teams, volleyball, basketball, soccer, baseball, softball? If you don't do this, an illustration that I heard this last week may come into practice. Boy I did as a girl went to the, went to the uh, girls' bathroom, raped a girl. He switched schools. He raped another girl. Uh, the dad of one of the rape girls went to the school board. When he stepped on the property, he was arrested. If that's not true, excellent. If it is even possibly true, we better, as Barney Five said, nip it in the bud before it gets out of hand. You might have to build a third bathroom. CRT, all races matter. All races are equally important. There is no evil race or evil person. Any policy that teaches division and aggression based on race and color has no place in our schools, either officially or unofficially. Involve the parents. You heard a little bit. No secrets, live stream the instructional classes so parents can see exactly what their children are learning or at least have the parents be able to check out the books that the kids are learning from. If you have nothing to hide, this shouldn't be a problem. Parents are important. If there are no parents, there would be no kids, no classrooms, no teachers, no school board. Not sure where that idea came from to prevent parents from being entirely involved, absolutely involved. Canada recently said parents, pa uh, parents are not to tell the teachers what to teach, I agree, but they, have, uh, they can entirely hear what they have to say. If you want me to talk half as fast, give me three minutes next time. Cottle, and then Miss Phyllis Eastman. Phyllis Eastman. Sorry. 
Supreme Court uh, 1964 case, New York Times versus Sullivan, is constitutional case law in this country. It states, quote, this nation is founded on the profound national commitment to the principle that debates on public issues shall be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. This is constitutional law in this nation. I spoke at a school board meeting in August and was surprised to hear the school board members' comments after the meeting. Instead of focusing on the legitimate, well-spoken, and thought-out concerns of parents, we were belittled and talked about as though we were the dregs of society. You even went so far as to say you felt threatened and that you were a victim of something. There was another member who kept asking for the chair to close public comment because people were instinctively showing support through clapping. This school board runs, likes to run like a courtroom. This is not a court. Public Public comment is for parents. They come here to express concerns. These, these mass mandates in our schools affect literally every breath our children take. But these aren't just students to us, like they are to you. They're our children, and we have every right to speak passionately about the abuse that is being inflicted on our kids. The silent majority is polite and tolerant, but we will not be bullied. We indulge you with compliance because we are good-natured. The truth is you feel threatened when parents don't comply because you are after compliance and not safety. There is absolutely no science behind these mask mandates. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Potter. Please, Ms. The timer. Well. Before I start, I'm going to give you a copy of my notes because I can't do it in a minute and a half, but um, I apologize for the clerical errors in advance, okay? Uh, Merrick Garland, U.S. Attorney General's daughter and son-in-law, have a psychometric data company called Panoramic Education, where it uh, is data mining and is in connection with Zuckerberg. The company is data mining our children throughout the country under the guise of social and emotional learning, which I, is a buzzword today in education. You've heard it tonight. Uh, the Department of Education, Virginia Department of Education, has a $250,000 contract with this company, and Fairfax County has a $1.8 million contract with Panorama Education. Question, does James City County have a contract with this company? No surveys should be given to students unless approved by this board, and all surveys given must be put on the teacher website so the parents can see it. I am interested in a survey from you all, and that is a survey of seniors who are graduating. I contend that so many kids, and I taught, do not know what to do after they get out of high school, and they have, they're just at a loss. And I would like to know. Thank you, Mrs. Eastman. Uh, you're going to provide your comments to the uh, clerk. Okay, that's the end of public comment. Consent agenda. Move forward with the consent agenda. Back to the motion for approval of the consent agenda 7.01, approval of financial report and monthly bills and payroll, September 2021, 7.02, approval of minutes from 9-21-21 meeting, 7.03, approval of minutes from 10-5-21 meeting, and approval of resolution R-1921 National School Psychology Week. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Owenby. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. Dow. Any discussion? Ms. Aller. Ms. Owenby. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved. 8.01, <laughs> approval of personnel actions. Can I get a motion for approval of personnel actions, please? Mr. Chair, I move approval of personnel actions as presented. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Any discussion? Mrs. Zoller? Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Owenby. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 8.02, approval of amendment of fiscal year 22 grants fund budget. 
Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the amendment to the grants fund budget to $23,010,984. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. OMB. Is any discussion? I appreciate that, Mrs. Young. No, hearing none, Ms. Holler? Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. OMB. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries 8.0 through. Me through. 8.03, <laughs> approval of amendment appointments to the 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee. Mr. Chairman, um, I, the, uh, I recommend that the board approve the appointments to the 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Is there a second? Are we supposed uh, to read them? Yeah, for a two-year term ending in uh, October 31st, 2023 is presented, and typically we do read them. Names. I don't think we do. I don't know that we do either. But Dr. Beers, can you uh, can you uh, read the names of the people who have been a um, who are on the committee for a two year, for the two year yeah. term ending? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chanel Allen, Amy Anderson, Julie Bar Bartolota, Susan Bell, Sharita Dobson, Todd Estes, Amanda Green, Ryan Hostetter, Roberta Lanham. Courtney Marcotte, David Scott, Sharon Spurlbaum, Nicole Stevens, Laurie Ann Stretch, and Aiken White. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dell. Any discussion? I would like to thank the members of the public who uh, stood up to be on this committee. Um, apologize for. Any, any names that we might have uh, <laughs> not pronounced exactly correct, but we gave it a good try. So thank you much. Um, I look forward to uh, the work of that committee. Ms. Aller? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. OMB. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye, thank you. Motion carries 8.04, approval of appointments to the Student Advisory Committee. Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I, I recommend that the board approve the appointments to the 21st, I'm sorry, to, the appointments of the Student Advisory Committee. For the following terms? And I'm, <laughs> Do you want to read them? Do you want to read the names? Yeah, I sure can. <laughs> I had Lester through July 23, Cadence Meekins through uh, June 23, Carson Aleski through 6:30-22, Arvin Picardo through 6:30-23, Jada Turner through 6:30-23, Javon Uzel Williams through 6:30-23, Harper Wagner through 6:30-23, and John Yu through 6:30-23. Thank you, Dr. Beers. I appreciate that. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Young. Is there any discussion? I really enjoy this committee. They, uh, we get good input from our students. Um, it's a very active and robust committee uh, uh, through history, or through, the, through the past 10 years or so that committee's <coughs> been around. And um, it's always a pleasure to, to talk to our thoughtful students and to get their input on issues before the school board. Any further discussion? Ms. Aller? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Mr. Dowell. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. OMB. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. 8.05 of approval of appointments to the Special Education Advisory Committee. Can I have a motion, Mrs. OMB? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I approve the following appointments to the Special Education Advisory Committee for terms ending October 31, 2023. Monica Grillo, Richard Hartman, Beth Hall, Lee Cadis, and Stephanie Watkins. Thank you, Ms. Ombi. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. Is there any discussion? I appreciate the members of the public standing up for this committee. This is a really important committee um, for the, our special needs students, and I uh, appreciate those members of the public who uh, 
want to, to play a part in that in the, that role. It's an important advisory committee to the school board. Any other discussion? Ms. Aller? Ms. Owenby? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Dowell? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. 9.01, board member comments. Ms. Owen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a few comments um, in response to speakers tonight. Um, wanted to um, point out it's my understanding that with regard to uh, the inclusion of pre-K students in our elementary buildings, that is um, dictated from the Virginia Department of Education. There's an expectation that pre-K students are, in fact, a part of the elementary experience. So to disclude them would fly in the face of what the VDOE um, expects. And then, I so many thoughts are going through my head. And sorry, so I'm a little discombobulated having lost my father. Things are just really tough sometimes. I, I think that there is a disconnect in this community. Um, I know that I have been a parent in this division for 20 years, have graduated three students from WJCC schools, and still have a high school student at Lafayette. I have been actively involved at every level, from PTA council, to band boosters, to athletic boosters, to PTA, to PTSA, to volunteering in the classrooms, and I know that is true of every single person on this board, except for maybe one, and all of us have graduated students from this division. So for anyone to say that we are disconnected and don't understand what's happening in our buildings is just wrong. We didn't just move here last March. Uh, we didn't just come to this dais from Loudoun County. We're fully invested. Um, these are not just students. They, they are our children. They're our children. So the disconnect for me, and I've, I've said this now since June, is that hyperbolic, national, partisan, political, Issues are being brought before this dais that have zero to do with what's happening in this community. And I will take a little liberty because I'm a short timer on this board and I'm moving out of my voting district, which is the only reason why I'm not running again. But the real issues that I encourage this community to consider and wrap your head and hands around are teacher burnout, learning loss, changing demographics, the students that we're serving in our division are, are poorer than they ever were before, have more learning issues than ever before, have more family trauma than ever before. We have the highest homeless rate on this region. People don't understand that. So the issues are not CRT, which our superintendent has made very clear. It's not being taught. And I encourage the community to, to understand what that is. It's not happening in our division. We're not gonna mandate vaccines. Our superintendent has made that clear. There will always be a choice for testing. If there is a recommendation to encourage vaccination, this community needs to understand we're, we're gonna run off our teachers. We're gonna run them off. We're looking at K-12 collapsing. We need to be supportive of our teachers, our administrators, of our school board. Not, not bringing partisan issues to this board and, and telling us that we don't care about our students because there's not a one of us that sits up here that doesn't think about our students and our teachers and our administrators and what they're doing every single day. So yeah, there is a disconnect. There is a very big disconnect from the people that I hear who come here who openly say they don't have kids in our division. I, my, I, I still have children in this division, so I'm not disconnected to what's happening in our classrooms. Not at all. But I have to question, if you just moved here last March and you've never stepped foot in our buildings, do you really know what's happening in our buildings? Sorry for that diatribe. Thank you, Ms. Zillenby. Dr. Beers? Uh, I don't really have any comment. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Ms. Young? Okay. Um, I guess I'll have my own diatribe. Uh, I do think there is a disconnect. Uh, and I believe that the disconnect comes when um, we, we seem not to listen. Um, I think there are real concerns. I do think there are national concerns. And to Ms. Ownby's point, I think we've been very fortunate that we have a superintendent that we do have 
who has kept many things at bay, but for how long? I don't know. And I think some of the issues, for example, the transgender student in Loudoun, I think that has raised national concern about the policies that are being implemented, and rightfully so. Parents have every right to expect that when their child goes to school that they will be safe. And I questioned uh, myself when I heard that um, because I have nothing against transgender students, but why is that even an issue for schools? The fact that it has been brought into the, the domain of the public school, in my opinion, is absolutely um, unconscionable because until children reach the age of puberty and have gone through puberty and have reached the age of brain development, which is 26 years old, we have put something on the school system that we should not have to deal with. But nationally, that's where we're at. I don't agree with it, and as an, um, I don't know if I guess I'm in that age of age discrimination, um, but it bothers me that, that our school board has to contend with those issues. I do think that parents have every right and every uh, reason to be concerned about what's happening in our schools. It's their domain. We are public servants. We are nothing more than that. Uh, when we think that we're more than that, I think we need to go look in the mirror and decide how did we get to where we're at. Um, I want the parents, from my own viewpoint, and I can only speak from for me, um, my, the parents that come here, I listen to them, I respect their viewpoint, I don't care that it's a national issue because if there's one thing that I know as a human being, that those issues trickle down into the public school. And as a teacher, and having taught, I know that it affects what we're teaching in the schools. Um, and having been um, confronted by several principals about things that I taught, for example, that a certain individual was not a good example to, for my kids to write reports on, um, I think we have the right to make moral decisions and we're not making them. Um, I do appreciate everything that the school board accomplishes, and I think that meant the work that we do is incredibly important. But I don't appreciate the disdain for what we don't think we want to deal with. And with that, Mr. Chair, I close my comments. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Ms. Hummel. No comments. Ms. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few comments. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Ms. Aller for her parliamentary work today in calling uh, the vote for the person uh, first who made the motion. That, uh, that was fun to, to listen to you do that. Uh, and so congratulations and thank you for, for that uh, parliamentary maneuvering. Um, uh, I also want to just comment on start times uh, that were mentioned today. I, I don't think there's anybody on this board or anyone in this division who's thrilled with the start times right the way they are right now. They're in response to um, uh, a challenging situation uh, that uh, I applaud the administration for making work, um, but it's really not. Uh, I don't particularly like you know, high school starting a couple minutes early either. Um, it's, it's hard on everybody and uh, no one's having fun with it and everybody's sacrificing a little bit. And, uh, and we're aware of that and so I just wanted to just sort of acknowledge that we all know it's not great, but we're doing our best. And so your understanding and appreciation is really um, welcome. Um, I also wanna just comment that um, I, all of us, uh, you know, Nobody sends an email to us and doesn't get a response, assuming that the email address is correct. And I encourage you all to look at that because sometimes we do get email addresses where they've typed it, the, it incorrectly and they don't get a response, but we never got the email. So I just want to say that. But if anyone who sends an email to us gets a response, anyone who sends a text, anyone who calls, except for I lost my school board phone, so don't call me this week. Um, <laughs> But, um, but you will get a return call. All of us are open to chatting on the phone. All of us are open to meeting for you know coffee. So please do that. Um, in addition to coming here to talk, um, you know, please reach out to someone who you think might disagree with you because you might learn something and 
you know, any disconnect that you may feel actually may turn into a connection rather than a disconnection. So I just encourage that. Um, and then lastly, just in terms of, um, I, I, I I agree that national uh, partisan issues that have nothing or little to do with uh, the work of this school board, uh, should, I, I don't think those issues should come before us. I think they're frankly irrelevant and don't deserve um, our comment. However, um, you know, there was a kerfluffle in the news about the National School Board Association statement, and that is directly related to school board, so I do want to comment on that. And the Virginia School Board, um, issued a, a, a statement about that, and I concur with their statement, um, you know, uh, and, I, and I support the Virginia School Board Association and their response to that, um, what I believe is an unfortunate statement. And so again, normally I wouldn't talk about national political things that have nothing to do with us, but since that's a School Board Association issue, I felt like I should comment that, um, yeah, that I think the Virginia School Board Association responded appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Mr. Dowell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, uh, we had a speaker that mentioned, Mr. Lagerman, that he had brought this up a few times before, the live stream of, and recording of instructional material. I will confess that was the first time I had heard that, but I do listen to all of our comments from our, our public speakers. Uh, that's intriguing, uh, an intriguing thought and, and proposition that um, you know maybe we could examine as a division, whether that's doable, achievable. Um, uh, and I don't know in what span of uh, space or time, but uh, I appreciate the transparency that that would offer our uh, classrooms and our teachers for the sake of parents and guardians. Uh, I can see that being a great benefit. We saw that benefit um, last year and the year prior in 2020 when it was 100% virtual and parents were looking over their kids' shoulders and they were appreciating the hard work of our educators. So I like it from that standpoint, but I also like it from the, uh, the perspective that when a student cannot be in the classroom, they can still be engaged with the classroom. Um, perhaps not uh, on, a, on a synchronous basis, but uh, I think there's value there. So I appreciate you bringing that up again, sir. Uh, I missed it the first time. Uh, I was really, really disturbed to hear from one of our students that he looks over his shoulder as I picture him in a restroom to find a female coming out of a stall when he thinks that he is safe in a male restroom. Incredibly disturbed by that. Um, I heard another speaker ahead of that saying that, and I wrote this uh, not exactly in quotes, but that this board supports all gender bathrooms. Uh, I, I've never been a part of any discussion or, or even vote where we discussed all gender bathrooms. From my standpoint, I am not in support of that. What I am in support of is protecting all students. And, and I don't necessarily say this for the benefit of uh, parents because they need to hear this from me, but I do say for the benefit of our division senior leadership that that needs to be our priority. Keeping kids in the classroom this year, protecting all students all students, transgender, cisgender, heterosexual, all students need to be protected. And when I see that circumstance, that situation playing out in my mind, yes, the boy shocked, the girl's in danger, the girl's at risk. And she was fortunate that that young man had, uh, was a decent young man that was not going to harm or hurt uh, or, or put her in jeopardy. Um, that young lady was put at risk. Uh, I, I don't know the circumstances surrounding her using that restroom. This is the first time I'm hearing this, but perhaps the senior leadership is aware of this circumstance. But we need to be looking at how we keep our students protected and out of that scenario so that we don't see issues like Loudoun County. Uh, true or not, I don't know. Uh, the creep up here in Williamsburg, James City County. All students need to be protected. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I don't know uh, if that sounds like a safety security issue, perhaps off channel. I would appreciate that to know how we're keeping those students, all students protected in that way. Um, and then parent inclusion. And, and I, I do get the appreciation that we pulled this policy. 
a discussion off the table last uh, last meeting and taking it back to policy committee and I agreed I, I seconded that motion I agreed that it needs to be re-looked at so that uh, so that uh, the community understands that we are caring for the uh, the home environment, the parent and guardian's um, right to to be informed and to weigh in on instructional material. Uh, for my part, and I, I don't think that there's any board member up here that would disagree that every single parent and guardian has a right to know what their child, we would call them students, I call them students, I work at a church and I call our youth group children's students, what your students are involved in. Um, and the instructional material that's been uh, given to them and, and how the classroom is being run, yes, parents need to know. Parents need to be inquiring that of their students, having those meetings with teachers. There's in no way, shape, or form do I believe that this board is trying to block out any or box out any parent or guardian from doing what their natural right is, which is raising their own children. Uh, that's not my job. My job is not to raise your children. Um, so we believe that. I believe that. That policy will come back. Uh, it will likely, likely look similar to what it did before because as I saw, it didn't take away any parent or guardian's rights or responsibilities uh, within the school division to inspect instructional material. Um, but we're going to look at it again. And so I just wanted to make that clear as I had stated in our last meeting, and that's still the case, that uh, we value everyone's input and, uh, and it's, it's a sacred responsibility that I don't want to trample on, and I won't. But that's all I have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dell. So much to unpack here. Um, I, I, know, uh, I know all our members of the General Assembly um, consider them friends, whether they're on one side of the aisle or the other. And I always had the opportunity whenever I meet them, whether socially, professionally, to say, you guys passed bad law in Richmond and I get yelled at. Um, they cut the budget for education, no big outright outreach. I, I cut, start cutting teachers, I get yelled at. Nobody's yelling at the General Assembly. And the one member of the one member will tell me that uh, when he was long ago, when he was a member of the Board of Supervisors, uh, he had a recurring nightmare that he woke up one day and he was on the school board. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason and the reason why that is, is that we are members of the public. When we're sitting up here on the school board, you know, we're we're one of seven, and it's really the only time that we have any quote unquote authority. Uh, when we're off of the when we're off the dais and out of session, and we're just citizens. Um, we are parents, we are members of the public, we go to the same grocery stores all of you go to, we go to the same soccer fields, football games, school events, we're out there in the public just like everybody else. Uh, I've been involved in WJCC schools, my or my family, for 31 years. Been here for a long time, seen a lot of schools a lot of schools uh, go up. I've seen a lot of stoplights go up. Seen a lot of a lot of farms go down and shops go up in those farms. Seen a lot of change in that 32 years I've lived here in Williamsburg. Um, so to say that we don't listen to the citizens, I mean, you know, we listen to we listen to public comment, and so we have I don't know, a couple of dozen people come talk to us. Um, my last election, when I had 4,000 people vote for me, I think that's pretty comparable for each one of the members who are up here. So the, the, the public is much broader than who comes to speak to us at, the, at our public comment. Um, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions. Some of them are more vocal than others. Some of them are not very vocal until you make a decision that goes against them and then they become vocal. We have, heard, we have learned that especially over the last two years. Um, so we represent all of the citizens, all of the students, all of the parents, all of the taxpayers, all of the citizens. That's what we do. Um, and so, you know, we have public comment here, and I, I believe in the public's right to come speak to us. I believe in their, in their right to espouse whatever opinion they choose, whether I agree with it or not. 
That's part of what makes America, America. It's part of what gives us our freedom. I, I am fully up with that. But we expect you to do it with respect and decorum so that all opinions are welcome at the dais. We don't, I have heard from members of the public saying that they wouldn't come here because, and speak their opinion, because there is so much other opinion in the audience that's vocal and intimidating. And that's not what we, as a society, want. We want to hear everyone's opinion. We want, this board wants to hear every, everybody's opinion. Um, and we do. As Mrs. Cook said, we get emails, we get phone calls, but we also are out in the public. I'm in, I'm, when I'm shopping for cereal in the grocery store, people are talking to me. So, you know, that's, that's what makes school boards especially because, you know, the Board of Supervisors, um, they are, they're also a little bit detached. I mean, I deal with, with uh, mama's babies and, you know, you don't want to get between a mama and her cub, right? Um, when, we, when we talk about uh, redistricting schools, uh, you get some opinions on that, let me tell you that. So, um, you know, we set, the, we set the time limit at a minute and a half because we wanted the public to know what the rules were going to be when we got here. Um, you know, we said three minutes, we, before our rules were three minutes and then we would cut it down to 30, um, cut, you know, to make sure it heats 30 and so we thought people were getting a little angst because they would get here and then they'd have their three minutes comments, they'd have to cut to one and a half. So, um, you know, that's kind of the rules we have going forward so that people can be prepared and understand what the rules are going to be. So, um, I agree with what Mrs. Cook said about start times. Nobody's really a big fan of that. Hopefully we can, we can um, get our bus driver situation where we need to be and so we can do that right. I agree with what Ms. Cook said about NSBA. Um, I don't look at the people who come here as domestic terrorists. Um, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that's right. Um, you know, and for, for us, it, it kind of gives the opinion that we're trying to hide behind a law. We're not trying to hide behind a law. We want to hear people come. But I would also tell you that at Board of Supervisor meetings and school board meetings, we take public comment. The General Assembly doesn't. House of Delegates doesn't. The State Senate doesn't. The House of Representatives doesn't. The U.S. Congress doesn't. And the President doesn't. They don't listen to, they don't have a public comment session where they can come out. So, you know, that's a, that's, it's not a constitutional right that we have to have public comment, but every year I have been on this school board, we have, we have wanted that, we appreciate that, we want the public to come out and talk. So, um, you know, I, I, guess in, I guess in summation, we're, we're you. I mean, we are, we are the public. We, we are out there in your community, in our community, driving on our roads. I cut my own grass. I mean, it's, we are you. So to say that we are disconnected from the community, we are the community. We're part of the community. We live where you live. So, um, and I hope, I hope that that can be appreciated. Um, I guess, I guess that's really kind of all I had to say. So it's a, it is a privilege to serve up here. It's a responsibility to serve up here. And we have to, but we have to take in consideration all of the kids. When we make a decision, we have to understand all of the impacts, budget impacts, what it hits to, how it, how it hurts, helps our kids, what it, what it does to our kids. So, so um, and when you're, when you come before, you don't have to necessarily consider all of those, all of those facts until you are privileged enough to sit in this chair and make those decisions. So, um, I hope, I hope that uh, we certainly have an appreciation for the public because we are the public. Uh, I have espoused enough. Uh, upcoming meetings. We have the policy committee, no committee meeting October 21st, 8.30 a.m. in virtual and in room 300. The 21st Century and Crew Ready Advisory Committee, November 10th, 3.30 p.m. in Legacy Hall in Newtown. Special Education Advisory Committee, November 11th, 6.30 in a virtual manner. And the Student Advisory Committee, uh, November 17th at 3 o'clock at Lafayette High School Media Center. Upcoming meetings of the school board are closed session, November 9th at 6 o'clock, room 300 at Blair, followed by the work session and action items, 
November 9th at 6.30, also in room 300 at Blair, and a closed session November 16th here at the Stryker Center at 6 o'clock, followed by a regular meeting at 6.30 at the, also here at the Stryker Center. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all.